Hello everyone. Thanks for joining the session today at the 2022 Tribal EPA Region 9 Conference. I'm delighted to be back again this year and talking about this topic, non-chemical options for pest control in community environments. I have received a lot of questions about this over the past several years. A lot of people are interested in non-chemical options for pest control because they are aware to some extent about the dangers of excessive pesticide use, uh, of excessive chemical pesticide use specifically. And it's great to have a bunch of non-chemical options in your pest management toolbox, no doubt. Some of these are excellent tools that uh, pests don't develop resistance to, so they will never go out of value. But are all non-chemical options safe? What should we keep in mind before using some of these options? Let's look at all of that in this presentation. So what comes to mind when you hear the term non-chemical? Think about it. Here are a number of non-chemical methods for pest control. Did anyone or everyone think of these? Did anyone think of biological control? There's uh, traps, botanicals, vinegar, essential oils. There's a number of them. Now let's look at these terms. Very often they are used interchangeably, but are they the same? So there's organic which means no chemicals or no man-made chemicals, only plant-derived or homemade. What does it mean? And if it's natural, does it mean it's derived from nature? Or is it something that's occurring naturally and it's used as is? How about non-chemical? Does non-chemical mean plant-based, animal-based? Does it mean cultural, physical, mechanical or biological? It's quite confusing when you look at it this way, right? So let's take a look at some of these in more detail. First of all, organic. Organic, the term organic can mean different things to different people. If you're a grower growing crops or produce, then this is something to be aware of, the National Organic Program. Now this is a federal regulatory program that develops and enforces certain standards for agricultural products in the US. Anyone heard about this program? That's the website of the National Organic Program. It's a part of the USDA, Agricultural Marketing Service actually. And um, here on the website, you can find a lot of information and definitions. So according to this website, the definition of organic is that it is a labeling term. I just pulled out that verbiage from the website and it's enlarged over here. So organic is a labeling term that indicates that the food or other agricultural product has been produced according to the USDA organic standards. These methods integrate cultural, biological and mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, irradiation and genetic engineering may not be used. So that's the, those are the requirements for the organic uh, production standards of the USDA. And there is this organization, OMRI, or the Organic Materials Review Institute, which is a nonprofit that provides an independent review of products that are intended for use in organic production based on the national organic standards. And accepted products are listed on their website. This is good to know. Of course, it is only required for organic production, uh, but the products listed there are no doubt passed through some level of scrutiny and are therefore relatively low risk. That is the point. Okay, so do check out the OMRI website and the OMRI has lists for different purposes for crops, for livestock applications and these can apply for domestic animals as well. And then there are lists for processing and handling products too. So do check it out. 
from the crop products list here are a few groups of organic pesticides that can be used in crop production as well as in home and home gardens and landscapes so these include bt or bacillus thuringiensis copper neem oils different kinds of oils and pyrethrum so these are the kinds of uh, groups that you will find on the omri uh, lists how about other sources of information for low, low risk pesticides that can be used in and around homes and buildings the npic or national pesticide information center is a great resource and provides information on different low risk choices always remember that the lowest risk comes with using no pesticides at all and uh, that is something that is not always possible i do understand that however we can minimize the risk uh, minimize the need for pesticides by using ipm or integrated pest management techniques but more on that later let's take a look at some of the sources that are listed on the npic page for low risk pesticides okay and one of them is safer choice how many of you have you heard about safer choice safer choice is a, is a is like a brand it's it's almost a brand that uh, you can look for a logo that you can look for on products so safer choice is actually an epa pollution prevention program which includes practices that reduce eliminate or prevent pollution as at its source such as using safer ingredients in products so safer choice helps consumers businesses and purchasers to find products that perform and at the same time contain ingredients that are safer for human health and the environment so that's a great uh, logo to look out for when you're shopping if you go to the safer choice web page within the epa website you can search for products that meet the safer choice standards so it's very very user friendly and you can um, search for products and they have different criteria as well here is another resource the cornell university new york state ipm program a website which provides lists of active ingredients that are eligible for minimum risk pesticide use so what are minimum risk pesticides they are products that do not need to be registered by the epa because their risk to the public and the environment is so low and this site lists out the active ingredients that are eligible for use as minimum risk pesticides now each of those links leads to a fact sheet with a lot of information about that particular active ingredient so that's another thing that you can check out another one another resource here is our water our world now our water our world is an award winning partnership program between um various city and county based agencies and they provide lists as well of uh, low low uh, risk pesticides and uh, the if you visit the website you can see they have lists of less toxic products organized by brand by pest by active ingredients etc so another great resource so we do have a lot of options right for places where to shop and information about them about low risk products etc but before going any further i want to ask a question a simple question okay true or false organic pesticides are safe for me and the environment true or false 5 seconds 1 2 3 4 4 and 5 what do you think yes the answer is false right so the thing to remember is that no pesticide is entirely safe you can never call a pesticide safe because it's a pesticide it's designed to kill and in the right dose any pesticide will kill and um, um it's also important to look for signal words 
on organic pesticides or any other low any pesticide label look for the signal words and some of those signal words on these pesticide labels include danger they can actually include danger and um, uh, the places where they are stored require are required sometimes to have those kinds of signs like right? pesticide storage area unauthorized persons keep out fire may to cause toxic fumes etc so no pesticide is eventually safe okay so that's something to keep in mind as we move forward with this okay so when you're out shopping how do you quickly identify low risk products so there's so many of them right so reading the label is the best idea low risk products are labeled with a signal word that says caution if they are high risk products of like in chemical pesticides the signal words will be warning or danger but if it's low risk the signal word will usually be caution and um, no matter how toxic a pesticide may be if it's low or medium or high it's always important to follow all of the label directions so you'll find me repeating that many times please follow the label the label is the law okay so here is an example of a common essential oil based product showing the caution signal word you see that the caution word is uh, is written in green and you can see it's circled in red over there okay so now let's take a look at some groups of these low risk pesticide options what are they how do they work okay first i'd like to talk about microbials so microbials or microbial pesticides are essentially pathogens or disease causing microbes that affect various insect pests microbials are a great option as low risk pesticides because they are very specific and work on targeted hosts and act in different ways most of these microbials are available as spores or virus particles formulated as a suspension or a powder and um, a lot of their effectiveness depends on the environment environmental factors especially humidity and they are also comparatively slow acting and may require repeated applications these are some things to keep in mind <clears throat> and um, an example of microbials that i want to talk about today is bt i hope most of you in the audience have heard about bt or used bt it is the most commonly used biological pesticide in the world okay so bt or bacillus thuringiensis is a naturally occurring gram positive spore forming bacterium now gram positive refers to the staining of the bacterial cells when they are treated with this particular kind of stain called gram stain it's a stain that's used in microbiology work and so like i just mentioned bt is is not a synthetic something synthetic or man made it's a very commonly occurring bacterium that's common in a lot of terrestrial habitats that include soil dead insects plants granaries uh, many different terrestrial habitats and uh, it has a very short residual when it's applied as an insecticide it's broken down in sunlight so it's something to keep in mind when making outdoor applications right it's broken down in sunlight by uv however the life can be extended with uv uv blockers or stickers so how does bt work it's a microbial pesticide so uh, it's clearly different from chemical pesticides right so let's look how it works so first of all for bt to work it has to be eaten by a susceptible pest in an insect it has to be consumed okay so when uh, the insecticide uh, the bt product is applied uh, the insect has and the insect eats it it's uh, that formulation the endotoxin binds to the insect gut the toxin contained in those particles binds to the insect gut 
or the digestive tract and creates a hole or a pore and when there are several of those holes the contents of the gut the gut contents pour out enter into enter into the blood stream and the body cavity and that is how it works so there is multiple pores or holes in the digestive tract and the feeding whatever the insect is feeding leaks out into the blood stream and does not uh, cannot be used by the insect so that's how it works so the insect slowly starves to death the feeding is slowed down first of all um, there's no immediate knockdown like in some chemical um, pesticides it takes a while but eventually the insect dies so that when does bt work best so clearly the stage so the early detection is very important for bt applications and proper application of course timing and location timing as in it has to uh, take into consideration the uh, presence of uv or sunlight uh, there has to be moisture or an uh, or a location where the pests can actually come across the applied product and consume it and uh, pest compatibility there's another very important point in bt applications so bt is not all the same all bt is not the same right so there's subspecies of this bacterium that are uh, most effective against certain orders of insects so for example bt kerstaki works against the lepidoptera or the moths and butterflies the caterpillars of moths and butterflies bt tenebrionis works against beetles and bt israelensis works on diptera or the flies and um, here is where mosquitoes come the dipt mosquitoes are dipterans and uh, mosquito dunks are a very common use of uh, uh uh use of a B, of a bt product against mosquitoes okay mosquito dunks so does that sound familiar as have many of you used it so the advantages of bt what are what is the green aspect of bt that makes it uh, a low risk pesticide well humans are not affected by bt that's the first thing first and foremost because our gut structure is very different from that of insects that's why it doesn't affect us then it is rapidly broken down by uv um it's safe for wildlife birds mammals and fish again because of the gut structure parasites and predators are not harmed directly in most cases because they are species specific and uh however loss of hosts could be a problem so for natural enemies out in the landscape that feed on uh, pest um, insect larvae and uh, the the adults too sometimes when bt is applied and a lot of those those host individuals are lost it can affect the natural enemy survival because they don't have any food right and it's also um, relatively safe to non targets like other moths and butterflies depending again on the species of bt that's applied okay so that's why bt is considered green right so now let's move on to another kind of low risk pro, uh, low risk low risk pesticide here this is a botanical and neem neem is the uh botanical we're going to talk about now and it's one of the, again one of the most commonly used botanical pesticides all over the world uh neem uh, is a is a tree neem uh, the neem tree as adaracta indica is native to southern asia and it's a tropical or subtropical tree it's considered as a cure for so many different ailments it's and it has been used for centuries for medical cosmetic and pesticidal purposes so the insecticidal or deterrent insect insect deterrent properties of neem were discovered since very very ancient times but have been documented um well documented as early as 1920 
and in 1959 a german entomologist noticed that neem trees in sudan where uh, we know there are there are these outbreaks of migratory locusts that wipe out hectares and hectares of cropped cropped land and all kinds of vegetation so in that situation this german entomologist noticed that neem trees resisted attack so that was one of the points where uh, you know that led to the uh, further further research and further work into the insecticidal and insect deterrent properties of neem okay so how do neem uh, products um, how, how are they made how are the products made from neem so all parts of the neem tree contain um, insect the insecticidal active ingredients however the most products uh, are made by crushing neem seeds okay and uh, they are uh, uh, subjected to water or solvent extraction and different kinds of solvents are used like so for example alcohol or acetone different types of uh, solvents are used for the ex extraction of the pesticidal constituents and different types of extraction processes lead to different amounts of uh, you know amounts recovered and uh, even the neem seed cake that is uh, that that is that remains after extraction can also be used as a fertilizer and a deterrent for nematodes and soil insects so here you can see how um, neem the neem seed cake looks after extraction and uh, in the lower picture there is an example of how neem cake is applied to the base of a tree or, or a shrub for uh, uh, fertilizer and possibly insect deterrent action so what are the mode of uh, modes of action of uh, these products so the active ingredient in neem is called azadiractin and it's only one of more than 70 compounds that is present that are present in neem and uh, solely azadiractin is uh, has been widely studied there are so many others so azadiractin has a number of different effects it can act, act as an insect growth regulator mean, meaning it can affect the life cycle of insects it uh, can affect the feeding so it's an anti feedant uh it can deter feeding so it's a feeding deterrent as well it's an oviposition deterrent which means that it prevents egg laying by insects and at uh, proper doses it can also kill so it's it can actually kill it can be lethal to certain insects and uh for neem products to act they have to uh, come in contact by the uh, insect the target insects or it has to be ingested it has to be consumed and when that happens it can prevent molting that's where it acts as an igr or insect growth regulator so it it can interfere with ectodyson production which ectodyson is the molting hormone in insects it can stop feeding which is a physiological effect and uh, it can prevent egg laying which is a repellent kind of effect so you can see there's so many different kinds of effects as for the efficacy neem has been or azadiractin has been listed for over 200 insect species and the efficacy can of course vary with the species uh, of insect in some for some insect is highly effective some not so much and because it's a botanical pesticide often multiple applications are required it's not a um, knock down kind of action so sometimes multiple applications are required so what are the green aspects of neem why is neem on the low risk pesticide list okay so first of all it's relatively non toxic to wildlife and humans it has little or no effect on adult beneficials beneficial insects out in the landscape and non targets it's very very suitable for inclusion in an ipm program for rotation with other chemical insecticides and um it has no significant risk to humans however the seed dust when seeds are crushed to produce uh, to or to extract the essential oils the seed dust is reported to cause some irritation to mucous membranes and the other thing to remember is that 
most of the studies about neem and neem products have been done using azadiractin which is the main active ingredient the other uh, active ingredients are not as well studied as azadiractin so we don't know for sure all about it yet okay so that's one thing uh, some things to keep in mind about neem but there's no doubt that it's a very very widely used low risk product and uh, um it is effective very very effective too next i'd like to talk about oils that are used as pesticides and there are a number of different types these can be synthetic and natural there are three main ingredient types active ingredient types they are petroleum or mineral oils there's fish oils and plant oils these can be uh, extracted from different parts of the plant uh, they can be uh normal oils or some are essential oils which contain a lot of uh, different chemicals uh, that give the uh, their particular characters to that oil in terms of uh, odor or uh, different other properties petroleum oils are uh, very very widely used there is a lot of available information about petroleum oils and, uh, and uh, they are listed for a large number of soft bodied insect pest control as well and the most important point about oils is actually that they are the only widely used class of pesticides to which insects and mites have not developed resistance how do oils act all oils interfere with gas exchange we know that oils and water don't mix right they form a layer on the surface of water so definitely for aquatic insects or their life stages that are aquatic oil can be applied as a layer on water bodies to prevent gas exchange oils applied to insect bodies directly can block the respiratory system and in some cases break down the cuticle plant and fish oils can have additional effects because of the presence of other constituents as in the case of essential oils now there are some products and i'll come to that in a second uh, that can be used for in other indoor pests but what are the green aspects of oils why are oils um, included in the low risk pest side list well first of all uh, they don't pests don't develop resistance to them um, they are used they are petroleum oils that are used on plants are light and generally evaporate quickly and um they have uh, neg a negligible ability to contaminate groundwater because they don't travel so much once they are applied they stay on the plant um and uh, plant and fish oils are not as volatile as petroleum oils but they break down quickly by microbial action because they're naturally occurring right and um, oils have generally have no effect on wildlife or non targets they can affect natural enemies um and then and cause for example mites in the landscape they can affect some beneficial mites and cause flare ups in population occasionally but in general they are of low toxicity to humans and typically disappear very soon and and certainly by the time a produce is harvested so that's the advantage of using oil and we have a long history of dormant oil use in fruit crops especially to control soft bodied insects and also mites and scales they're not as commonly used in vegetable crops mostly in fruit crop like trees and uh, sometimes oils are mixed uh, with or used in combination with other pesticides so that is also something to keep in mind how about essential oils so we talked mentioned a little bit about uh, plant oils oils that are derived from plants right and um, these are uh, there are so many different ones so many different plants contain essential oils and uh, a, a very common examples i can think of are clove clove and cinnamon uh, there's geranium right so many peppermint so many that we can think of and uh, essential plant based essential oils are primarily obtained by steam distillation 
or other process of extraction from plant leaves flowers or seeds and uh, these have different modes of action um, i don't want to go into details of each each one or each different kind of essential but generally the modes of action how they act is by preventing feeding so they are anti feedants or they affect uh, the life cycle of the insects by uh, especially processes like molting and uh, growth they can prevent respiration so they inhibit respiration they can uh, cause growth and cuticle disruption so basically they can act as insect growth regulators as well so a lot of these essential oils are formulated into products that can be over the counter products that can be used against common household indoor household pests like cockroaches crickets etc and are great uh, um, can be great uh, additions to your ipm plan so do consider them and uh, like with other natural uh, or uh, low risk products they don't uh, they often don't have dramatic knockdown action so they'll probably have to apply them multiple times but still they are low risk so that is the point okay so here's another botanical pesticide that i want to talk in a little bit more detail and that is pyrethrums so pyrethrum the term pyrethrum refers to the plant or the naturally occurring insecticide and the active ingredients in pyrethrums are called pyrethrins okay so pay attention to that so there's pyrethrum and pyrethrins and there's also this other term called pyrethroids right you must have come across all of these different terms so pyrethroids are synthetic they're not omri approved they're not organic they're not suitable for organic production they're synth they're man made they man made chemicals that are very similar in action to the naturally occurring pyrethrins so that's the point to remember so if you're talking about low risk the thrins the thrins and the and the thrums are the ones to keep in mind not the roids okay so the natural pyrethrins they are actually the dried powdered flower heads of the pyrethrum daisies so the plant are the plants from which these are extracted are called pyrethrum daisies and they native to southwest asia and uh, kenya is a leading producer of pyrethrums and pyrethrums have very broad spectrum activity they are not specific they are active against a wide range of insects and their mode of action is pretty dramatic actually so they are knock down they knock down products they act very fast as soon as an insect uh, a target insect comes in contact it will it will knock them down and how it does that is by affecting their nervous system so when uh, the insect comes in contact with the pyrethrum uh, insecticide it affects their nervous system and it causes the nervous uh, uh, nervous discharges to continually fire and finally uh, paralysis occurs and and then death so some insects can recover when exposed to pyrethrums uh, if the dose is low but in most cases the uh, action and the, uh, the action the final finally final action is death so uh, pyrethrum scan work with synergists to provide enhanced mortality and uh, these non chemical insecticidal uh, components in a, a formulation they work to heighten the response which basically how it works is that they reduce the insect's ability to detoxify the pyrethrum uh, piperonal butoxide or pbo is a very commonly used synergist but the thing to remember and and pbo is used in number of different formulations but the thing to remember is that pbo is not omri approved so if you're really shopping for uh, omri approved products look for pbo or piperonal butoxide and, and avoid products that have it okay and um, sometimes oils are also used as synergists along with pyrethrum now application tips while using pyrethrum pyrethrums are rapidly broken down by uv 
as well as ultraviolet rays or sunlight and they are also broken down by acid and alkaline solutions so it's a good idea not to mix them with lime sulfur or soap and pyrethrums need to be contacted or ingested by the target insects if you're spraying for insects for flying insects especially uh, it's good to spray in the early hours while they are less active and before bee activities is so something to really keep in mind like with synthetic pyrethroids even pyrethrins or pyrethrums naturally occurring um, insecticides are also very very toxic to bees bees and fish and also slightly toxic to birds to some extent so that is something to keep in mind while using pyrethrum okay and they can be toxic to beneficials too but they don't have a long residual so that way a lot of the beneficials can escape what are the green aspects of pyrethrums i think the best part is that they have little or no persistence they are very easily broken down in water to non toxic products their soil persistence is also very low with a half life of about 1 to 2 hours so they are very unlikely to concentrate in food chains they are very easily metabolized and they are also relatively non toxic to humans but we always recommend use with caution because some pyrethrum products can be inhaled now let's look at a few other soft pesticides these are also low risk pesticides that can be very useful uh, and suited for uh, use in and around homes and structures uh, some of these have short residual action some are selective and uh, do not generally affect beneficial organisms some are physical toxins toxicants to which resistance cannot be developed so that's a great character and um, we we'll look at some examples in a second but um, just remember that many of these soft pesticides can be rotated with traditional pesticides insecticides to slow down resistance development so that's a very very uh, good thing to have in your ipm plan unfortunately some are more expensive too okay so let's look at some of the desiccants so these are a, a common group of uh, low risk pesticides desiccants and uh, some common examples are listed here de or diatomaceous earth uh, boric acid silica gel and sucrose esters so many of these are physical uh, poisons and they have an abrasive effect on the insect cuticle so what happens is when these products come in contact with an insect we know that the insect has a cut has cuticle in their exoskeleton right and so they the these materials abrade or rub against the cuticle and create little holes through which the insect loses water it dies of dehydration that's how they work um, de is one of the most commonly used products on this uh, among desiccants they are used against a wide range of pests too both indoor and outdoor right so uh, has a uh, i just wanted to ask you know something to think about has anyone used de and uh, what kinds of pests have they used against uh, have you used uh, used it against Uh, landscape pests or um, how about scorpions i know a lot of people use de against scorpions uh, bed bugs bed um, de is a great um, addition to your bed bug management program if you have bed bugs they can it's a great for uh, wall void um, wall void treatments okay and um, um, desiccants um, Uh, as they are called they actually dry out like I, i just mentioned they dry out the body or the surface on which they are applied and um, desiccants have to be dry they cannot be wetted if they if they are wetted they lose their efficacy so they have to be in that dry free flowing powder state and uh, some products uh, that are uh, are specifically formulated along with chemical insecticides to in increase or improve their action for example the, the desiccant actually uh, abrades and makes the insect lose water 
and at the same time the insecticide that is added to the formulation also acts so it's like a double action another group of uh, soft pesticides is soaps and uh, these are also quite common commonly available over the counter as horticultural soaps um, but um, they can also be applied to other other insects they are, these act by disrupting cell membranes that's how they act and uh, they break down the cell membrane of the insect and these as opposed to desiccants these have to be wetted okay so some of these when applied to plants can cause phytotoxicity so that's something to keep in mind eating disruptors another group of soft pesticides and kaolin clay is a great example of that uh, it's it can be applied as a physical barrier uh, to fruits fruits on fruit trees so uh, if you have pests that that are chewing on your fruits um, this kaolin clay coats the fruit and other plant parts and prevents the pests from from eating it's it's uh, in the case of insects it is irritating to the insects and cause uh, causes them to groom excessively so you've seen insects if you've noticed insects some of them groom themselves right cockroaches sometimes groom themselves they clean their antennae right so it causes the insects to when it, it it coats the insects too and the insects don't like it so they they have to groom themselves excessively when they come in contact with uh, kaolin and and many other products like uh kaolin however it's safe for uh, for humans it it washes off pretty easily and um, in fact kaolin clay is used in number of cosmetics so it's considered safe to in uh, to humans insect growth regulators can be a, another valuable tool in your ipm program they have low mammalian toxicity and are very selective in the insects they control some biological control agents may be used together with igrs unfortunately igrs need to be applied more than once to achieve the control if the adult stage is causing damage another management tactic might be needed as well all right so till now we talked about various non chemical or low risk pesticide options for insects and other arthropods now let's look at some options for weeds because weeds are an important pest group and there are a number of options low risk herbicide options available a few of them are listed here i won't talk about each one but just two of them the first is maize gluten meal or corn gluten meal it was widely used and even patented as a pre-emergent herbicide in the 90s but later it was found to not have a real weed control effect cgm or mgm is actually a byproduct of corn milling which is high in nitrogen so it is nutritious for plants no doubt and it can promote vigorous growth and in the process smother weeds by itself it really does not have a significant herbicidal effect because there is not sufficient research in different locations to give conclusive results you can read more about it on the osu extension website and and different other uh, cooperative extension websites if you are interested the next herbicide i wanted to talk about is vinegar sure vinegar does have a burn down action on weeds but it is contact so it has to contact it will burn down what it contacts and um, it does it's not like other chemical herbicides so weeds do tend to resprout and this leads to reapplication often at higher concentrations this is the danger vinegar for weed control is usually um, at 20% concentration while household or cooking vinegar is 5 to 6% typically anything over 11% is actually dangerous and can burn skin and cause irreparable eye damage so about 20% it's definitely dangerous it is corrosive and even can even damage metal and concrete so weed control vinegar 
should really be treated as a herbicide and used with proper PPE. It actually has the signal word danger on the container. But consumers only see vinegar and this is very misleading. So that's some, definitely something to keep in mind when using vinegar. Okay. So till now, we looked at different uh, low-risk pesticide options. Things to spray or dust or treat different locations, right? But there are so many other non-chemical options for pest control other than to spray or to dust or treat. Let's look at some of those. First of all, cultural methods. There are a number of cultural practices that when performed correctly constitute what's known as cultural control. And these are not additional things to do, but are part of our normal uh, activities, whether it's outside in the landscape or indoors inside a home or building. And these go a long way in making the environment unfavorable or unattractive to pests. And that is how they reduce pest populations or prevent them from occurring. So you can think of so many different cultural practices. Sanitation is one. Exclusion is another. Right? Just to mention a, the most common ones. Mechanical or physical methods include actions or use of items to physically remove pests from a location or mechanically prevent them from accessing. So all the traps and barriers and even hand removal whenever possible are great options. Bugs get bugs too. That's biological control. And here are some examples of insects parasitized by other insects. And you can tell by the presence of pupae or eggs on their bodies. At the bottom right is a green lacewing larva attacking an aphid. Biological control occurs naturally in landscapes and biological control agents can also be introduced. Some are available commercially. So biological control is a great option, non-chemical option. We talked a lot about non-chemical options, right? I know it was a lot of information, but uh, we didn't say anything about chemical control, right? What is the, what are the concerns with chemical control? What are the concerns with dependence on pesticides and not using other pest management methods? So I think the all of the points listed here: pest resistance, environmental persistence bioaccumulation and biomagnification. These are some of the major, major concerns with pesticide dependence. And uh, the fact is that pesticides persist in the environment for long periods of time. And this leads to the phenomena known as bioaccumulation and biomagnification, which have really far reaching effects that are not fully understood, even with our advanced science and technology. But pest resistance, pest developing resistance is certainly something that we can. Insecticide resistance is one of the most important concerns with excessive pesticide use. Insecticide resistance is said to occur when a population of insects gains tolerance to a specific chemical or group of chemicals with the same mode of action. You can see in the graphic has how as time passes, and the pesticides are continued to be applied, the resistant populations indicated by the red insects increase until all the in insects we have are resistant and the pesticide no longer works. So keeping these concerns with excessive pesticide use in mind, Let's look at some realities with respect to the safe or the low risk pesticides. Well, home remedies and other unregistered pesticides can certainly be harmful to people, pets and the environment. Because of so many reasons, pesticide registration does not include product efficacy testing. It only tests the active ingredient, right? Um, and success in lab testing does not guarantee success in the field or in, in real life situations. 
improperly used products can contaminate the environment be it a high risk or a low risk pesticide and improperly used products can also create resistant pest populations broad spectrum products can kill beneficials and non targets along with the target pests and um, with the case of low risk pesticides and organics more frequent application is often necessary that's something to keep in mind these are not wonder drugs they are just low risk pesticides and some products will cause phytotoxicity if they are not used properly and can have other effects too so the bottom line is natural or non chemical does not equal safe as i come to the end of my presentation on non chemical methods for pest management in community environments i have to mention this concept of spot treatment spot treatments are localized treatments applied to a small area as opposed to the entire house or the entire building or the entire garden right so spot treatments are a great way to prevent infestations from spreading they don't always mean spraying something hand pulling of weeds is spot treatment hand picking of pests is spot treatment placing a sticky trap or inspecting one plant or one area of your landscape or your home is also spot treatment when i hear the term non chemical i am reminded of a symphony because i am interested in music a symphony is a group of musicians working together to create something beautiful right a piece of music and this is very similar if you think of to ipm i hope many of you in the audience have heard about ipm for for those of you that have this is a refresher right the definition of ipm if you have not then welcome to your introduction to this great concept the ipm can be defined in so many ways this is just one of them basically it is a holistic approach to pest management it is a science based sustainable decision making process that uses information on pest biology environmental data and technology to manage pest damage in a way that minimizes both economic costs and risks to people property and the environment and ipm uses an intelligent combination of different pest control methods depending on the situation and ipm works in any situation indoor or outdoor you don't have to use every one of these methods of course only what works best at that particular time and with that i come to the end of this presentation i'd like to acknowledge uh, the following people uh, linda chakar scott and brian layman and carrie peter for content on some of my slides and finally here's my contact information please feel free to reach out if you have any questions regarding ipm or non chemical pest management or anything that i presented upon okay so thank you all once again and stay safe out there